Major League Baseball has the New York Yankees. The National Football League has the New England Patriots. And it, when it comes to winning more championships than anyone else, barbershop quartetting has two men who stand out above the crowd. One is Tony DeRosa, and the other is our guest today on Shop Chat. We are so delighted to have with us a four-time international gold medalist, awesome Joe Connolly. Joe, so great to have you on the show today. Oh, and when you walk down the avenue, avenue. I just can't believe that it's you. You've got those painted lips, painted eyes, wearing the bird of paradise. It all seems wrong somehow, that you nobody, sweetheart, sweetheart. How could you believe me when I said I love you when you know I've been a liar all my life? I've had that reputation since I was a youth. You must have been insane to think I'd tell you the truth. How could you believe me when As long as you're not in love with anyone else, why don't you fall in love with me? You're deriving me crazy, baby, trying to guess. so much for the invite. It's awesome to see you, Shane. So, Joe, I wanted to ask you a little bit about uh, some of the things that maybe most barber shoppers don't know about your background. Um, you are an only child, if I remember I... correctly, and uh, I am too, and I think you'll agree with me that only children are more mature, more competent than just about any other sibling children there are. I agree but... because we have limited data. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm curious for you, I know that a lot of uh, little brothers in a family with a lot of boys tend to be very competitive because their brothers drive them to be. You're an only child, but what that means is you're playing games with, with your dad, who just happens to be a fantastic barber shopper named Mike Conley. And um, I'm just curious, what impact did that have on developing your, your drive to compete? Well, uh, it's, thanks for the question. It's awesome. So obviously my father is one of my all-time great teachers inside and outside of barbershop. So I was very lucky to be a second generation barbershopper. So I think in most walks of life, I find in my studies, even outside of barbershop, although I have limited data outside of the barbershop world, it seems like second generation seem to have a head start on others because they've been brought up in the environment. So I was really lucky to be brought up in the barbershop harmony environment, meaning before I was born, my dad was involved in it. So being an only child, my dad was teaching me basically anything about competitive sports or first thing we ever competed against each other that he taught me was checkers. And then quickly <laughs> we upgraded to chess and such. But my teacher of all things early on, of course, was my father. And because I didn't have brothers or sisters, well, none that survived, he was the one that had to teach me uh, and so he was quite competitive himself inside and outside of barbershop. So one of my fond memories of my dad telling me when I was just quite old enough to understand after we had played chess pretty consistently for about a year and a half and I couldn't beat him, although I would get closer and the games would last a lot longer, I couldn't quite beat him and uh, broke down at the end of a long match one time and he goes, hey, hang in there. I just want you to know something. There's a lot of other dads that in this situation would let their son win to make them feel better about themselves and to build their confidence and help them grow as a person. I just want to let you know, I'm never going to do that. <laughs> he says, I'm always, he goes, I'm always going to compete against you full out. <laughs> he goes, when you eventually beat me at something and you will, and I tell you right after you beat me that I let you win, know now that I'll be lying. Right. So in advance, he told me that he would give it his all in anything that we would do when it came to competition. 
So he was like my big brother, if you will, in the sense of yeah. there was a lot of friendly, intense competition between father and son or big brother Mike, as it were. That's great. Now, of course, your dad won medals with the Naturals, but in your childhood, you would have heard him rehearsing with a fantastic quartet called the Roaring Twenties. What impact did the Roaring Twenties have on you and your love for barbershop? Well, it was all about the Roaring Twenties. In a great way, the, the Men's International in 1978, yes, I'm that old, was in <laughs> Cincinnati, Ohio, which was right in my backyard. I was 13 years old. I had been to a couple of high-end Southern Gateway Chorus shows. Of course, the chorus is a two-time international champion, and they always put on unbelievably entertaining shows and usually would have guest top-shelf quartets. And one of the in-house guests, of course, was the multi-medalist Roaring Twenties. But the first competition that I got to attend was 1978 in Cincinnati. And that was my dad's first competition back with the Roaring Twenties. He was their original lead when they formed back in 1960. Hmm. And then I was born in 1965. He was working and traveling a lot with Procter and Gamble. And uh, to be home with the family more when he wasn't traveling with work, he stepped down from the Roaring Twenties. And then they added in their longtime lead, Jerry Kelly, who's more of the face, if you will, of the franchise when it comes to the lead singers. But in a cool way, when the Twenties first formed back in 1960, they were all still in high school, and they relied on a barbershop confidant who was also a member of the Southern Gateway Chorus. They all went to Elder High School, which was an all-boys Catholic high school. So Don Gray was a, a senior. He had actually already graduated from Elder, and the other guys were still in high school. And both Ron Riggler and my father wanted to sing baritone with Tom Schlinkert and Don Gray. And they couldn't decide on who would sing baritone and who would sing lead. So they agreed to each learn two songs on each part and let Ed Weber, former elder grad and also stage presence judge back in the old judging system and coach, in-house coach for Southern Gateway to decide. He'd listen to both combos <laughs> and decide who would sing lead, who would sing baritone. So my dad lost the bet, as it were. They both <laughs> wanted baritone, so dad sang lead. So in a neat way, although this was before I was totally involved in following the Roaring Twenties, when Ron Riggler was battling uh, severe health challenges towards the end of the road, and he knew that he wouldn't be around much longer, and the Roaring Twenties had already advanced all the way up to two-time fifth-place bronze medalist in 1976 and 77, uh, Ron asked that his replacement be after he passed was his graduating best friend, my father, Mike Conley, to come mm. back and face him as the baritone because Ron said Mike was a better baritone and lead than I, and he got stuck with the lead part, so I want to make sure. <laughs> so now back to your question. Thanks for your patience and following the bouncing pitch pipe. Sure. So then we head to the 1978 International, which is my dad's first international competing as the baritone of the Roaring Twenties in our backyard. And I got to go with my mother because it was only 30 minutes from where we lived. So I got to see all 49 quartets compete. Back then, Shane, they would choose the qualifiers not by point totals, but by the population of the 16 districts that we had at the time. Huh. So the bigger the district, the more quartet representatives you would get to send. And if you had a returning second through fifth place medalist from the previous international, and they qualified in whatever your amount of quartets you were allowed. They still had to compete in the prelims, but if they made one of the spots that were eligible for the district, your district got an extra quartet so that the ah. men would take up a spot in a neat way. And that continued until we updated our scoring system and such. But in a cool way, the Roaring Twenties were in, and I was sitting there watching the best 49 quartets on the globe. And at that time, the 16 district champion choruses no wild cards, no affiliates. It was early on. And so you would just see the 16 best choruses, the 16 district champions. So I watched them all, all 49 quartets, all 16 choruses, watched all top 20 quartets in the semifinals, watched all top 10 quartets in the finals. So just as the dust settled, to give you a view of my first ever high level competitive barbershop experience, after the dust settled, 
the 1978 International Quartet Champions were the Bluegrass Student Union, followed by the silver medalist Grandma's Boys, who won the very next year in 1979, followed by the third place bronze medalist Boston Common, who was second to the Grandma's Boys the following year and won it all in 1980. And in fourth place, my dad's quartet, the Roaring Twenties. So I saw my dad and those other three of the greatest quartets in the history of our sport sing to an audience of just over 11,000 people in the Cincinnati Convention Center. So when the very best quartets and choruses finished their sets without any musical instruments in the background, only four voices that sounded like a lot more, and over 11,000 people jumped to their feet <laughs> and screamed their pleasure and acceptance of that style of music. I was absolutely hooked that first week in July, 1978, in Cincinnati, Ohio, in my backyard. And the next week, I begged my father to attend the next Southern Gateway Chorus rehearsal the very next Tuesday night. By the way, as a side note, not really a side note, the Southern Gateway Chorus finished in the third place bronze medals position in that stunning contest in their backyard behind the unbelievable Louisville thoroughbreds under the direction of Jim Miller, who edged the vocal majority, <laughs> the unbelievable direction of Jim Clancy by a scant 10 points. And my hometown chorus finished third behind two of the greatest international champion choruses in the history of the sport. To say that I was hooked after that would be a severe understatement. Okay, I'll let you catch your breath now, Shane. That's all right. Also in that quartet contest was the Rural Route 4 and Classic Collection. Yes, and, and the Friends of Yesterday, and the Baltimore and Iowa Connection, and the Vagabonds, and the Nova Chords, but who's yeah. counting? And the Harmonizers were also in that college. I mean, that has to be one of the greatest single international competitions of all time. And it happened to be the one you got to go to right in your backyard. Yeah, so I got the highest level of play at that time. And how could I not be hooked? That's and then fantastic. following that, I got to sit in on the fourth best quartet on the Globe's rehearsal every Wednesday night at Don Gray's apartment. So I begged my dad to attend so I could watch one of the greatest quartets in our history rehearse. Yeah. Not only did they finish as high as third, they were one of the most popular entertaining show quartets for decades, doing over 30 weekends a year for a few decades in a row. So I learned from the masters on Don Gray's couch. Shame on me if something didn't stick. <laughs> now, as you were joining the Southern Gateway Chorus, you end up meeting someone who plays a huge role in your performing experience named Larry Ager. Um, no, Mr. Ager passed away the, the same year that I joined the society, so I never got to know him, but over the years have heard so much about him. There's a whole generation of us that never got to meet him or, or see him in action. I'd love for you to tell our audience some about Mr. Ager. Man, he was not only one of my greatest teachers, he was one of my very best friends. Larry was awesome. Yeah. So uh, we first met, we were both, well, actually at the time he was singing lead in the Southern Gateway Chorus and my voice had not changed yet. So I was still singing tenor, Shane, like you. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm waiting for my voice to change too. So <laughs> Exactly. So even, even though we weren't in the same voice part, I stood in the window in front of him. So I was like in the second row of the chorus. Right. He was in the fourth row right behind me. I think I can send you a photo of that later on. Great. Uh, but that's how I got to meet him in a cool way. Uh, he introduced himself and he said, my name's Larry Ager. And it wasn't much beyond that initially. And then whenever I'd have any question at all, I would ask, I would ask Larry privately because back then in that setting with Tom Gentle as our director and a master musician and arranger and also a high school choral teacher, he, had, he ran a very strict ship and they had allowed me in earlier than their initial chapter bylaws. At that time it was 16 and I was 13. Yeah. So they updated the rules because they knew my dad and figured they could hold him accountable if things ran <laughs> out. Sure. So, that's how I got in three years ahead of schedule. So I would just quietly stand there on the risers. And even though I wasn't a sight reader, 
And unfortunately, we didn't have top shelf learning media from Tony DeRosa or Tim Ory because they weren't born yet. Right. So, <laughs> the fly, there was no such thing as learning tracks. You would just listen to the other tenors around you, follow along on the music. And if you weren't a great sight reader, you didn't chirp up about it. You would just listen over and over again until you were sure you had the part. And if you were uncertain, you would ask. And Larry was always there for me. And also when my voice started to change and switching to the lead part, he was instrumental there musically, even beyond the aspect of performance and working the mental, the inner game of barbershop, if you will, uh, that aspect of, he helped me a huge amount mentally, especially the interstate rivals on our last year running into Hartford. And then of course, every quartet after that, keepsake, him and Jim Casey were huge, but him, Larry, in a nutshell, was a student of the game. When he first came on board, he knew nothing of our sport, mm -hmm. but he was a high-end business guy and had the mind of seeing people and seeing the best in people and always nurturing that. And then once he put it on your radar in a cool way and mentally had you aware of it, then there was no stopping. Whoever, you fill in the blank, whoever right. was lucky recipient of that guardianship from Larry. And he was instrumental in writing the presentation category. When we first switched over to those categories, officially in the fall of 1993, and then moving on from there, the first international was 1994, uh, under that system at the right. time. Larry was huge in helping write that category, of course, along with Steve Plum. That's fantastic. Now, I, uh, I'm assuming that it's in Southern Gateway that you also met Jeff Muka. Yes. And then as time goes by, you obviously had to have some connection that put you in touch with uh, Kip Buckner and Jay Hawkins. Can you describe what were the events that led to the formation of the Interstate Rivals? <laughs> this is like the stuff never before released, Shane. This All right. This is what we want right here. <laughs> so I had been, I can't believe I'm actually saying this out loud, but I had been a huge Jay Hawkins fan. For <laughs> So when I first met Jay, he was a stud baritone in a quartet called the Coalition, who were Johnny, Johnny Apple Appleseed. Yeah, Amps, absolutely, Johnny Appleseed District Champs, and got as high as 13th at international. Uh, in fact, they were the 13th place semifinalist in that 1978 international, oh. Cincinnati, Ohio. So that was my first data point of the Coalition, and they were actually ninth in the middle round. Jay would want me to mention that. Right. So, <laughs> around the coalition so anyway i was a huge fan of jay's he was always up positive always willing to sing tags with me uh and he was in the judging program he was going through the judging program to be a sound judge at the time and he was up practice judging in johnny appleseed district his old stomping grounds he had moved down to cardinal the district right below johnny appleseed district to marry the infamous at the time <laughs> jim miller's daughter kathy uh, now Kathy Hawkins, of course, which is awesome. So he moved to Louisville and then got entrenched in that great history of the Louisville thoroughbreds. So when he was judging uh, at a 1982 prelims in JAD, I was singing a quartet called the Tag Team. And after the uh, evals, at the time they were actually called A&Rs back then, analysis and recommendation, but that mm -hmm. was too scary. So we had right. to update. But so anyway, when he had shared that information and we had debriefed at the end of the night he goes hey you know i'm uh, singing bass now with a little... <laughs> and it like he gives me his card it was money also he had this well this, this is a conflict of sing. interest this is terrible business card jay hawkins trolling for leads and johnny <laughs> so he had this business card that just said jay hawkins had had his phone number i think yeah this was definitely prior to email so it was just his right. phone at the time and he goes hey man we should we should at least team up for fun and I had told him that I had been singing with Jeff Muka and we had been trying to move forward with the tag team. And he goes, hey, I got a great tenor down in Louisville and we're only about 90 miles apart. It's sure. at least getting together once to see, you know, sing some tags, see if we like it, hit it off. So it was Jay's idea in a cool way. And he was the most experienced guy uh, in the society at the time and also a high-end quartet baritone guy, even though he had recently switched to bass. He could never make up his mind. Yeah. baritone bass, as we've discovered for decades now. Right, right. I can't imagine how much fun it would have been to be coming into barbershop, living 
in an area where you have these two epic mega centers of barbershop power an hour and a half apart from each other. I mean, it was unbelievable. And just north of that, Shane, I was spoiled on the Sweet Adeline side of things. At that time frame, Gem City, just south of Dayton, Ohio, mm -hmm. Gene Barford, man, they were, the, they were the gold medal standard then for Sweet Adeline's and her quartet, The Sounds of Music, the 1974 Queens of Harmony. So the highest level of play in women's and men's barbershop, I got it at an early age. I was so blessed, very lucky. That's fantastic. So Interstate Rivals ends up forming, obviously getting its name from the Louisville, Cincinnati, I-71 connection it. there. That's it. And so you guys form, and lo and behold, you win your first district contest in Cardinal. We did. And then you go to International, and you have this fantastic climb. You start out at 10th, and then 6th, and then 3rd, and then 2nd. Um, how old, by the way, how old would you guys have been when the quartet started? Let's see, when we have first started in 82, it would have been, I would have been 17. <laughs> Kip would have been, it might be before Kip's 19th birthday, so Kip still would have been 18. Ugh, I might choke now on Jeff right. and Jay. They were 23 and 25, I believe. Right. I, I think it's funny sometimes. I mean, I'm all in favor of supporting uh, Youth and Harmony and the youth movement. But it is sometimes it's amusing when people talk about a youth movement as if it is a new thing. <laughs> when if you go back to that era, you've got Bluegrass Student Union, oh. all very young. You guys, yeah. Cincinnati kids. I mean, yep. there was a pretty epic, uh, the Rapscads, there's a pretty epic yep. youth movement. Back in Harrington that day Brothers, Harrington Brothers that segued into sure. the second edition. No, it was it was a fierce young battleground. We were we were having the collegiate contest in 1984 before anyone was going to college. Right, <laughs> that's <laughs> right. So then you guys get to second place in 1986, and then uh, your baritone Jeff has a transfer, and now all of a sudden you're scrambling to find a new baritone. In, in a great position to maybe even win a championship, but to have a voice part change all of a sudden, describe the process that led to uh, your, your victory then in 1987. Will do. It's funny looking back on it, Shane, because at that time, our baritone, our initial baritone, Jeff Muka, from the beginning all the way through our silver medal in 1986, we knew prior to the international, between the prelims and international, that he would not be in the area. So we were, back then, it was like if you couldn't rehearse every week, it was unthought of that you would right. continue respectfully. So right. even though he was only about six hours away, we at that time, and him being a U.S. letter carrier, we didn't think we could continue at the highest level and keep it sharp enough. And we all agreed, although we were bummed. Right. Uh, so from that point on, uh, I knew Paul Gilman in a cool way from the Southern Gateway course, but more importantly, Paul and I had sung together at Kings Island Amusement Park, just a bit north of Cincinnati during the summer, uh, a couple of summers with Steve Thacker, the base of the Cincinnati Kids, who had, he had uh, hooked up the gig for us, as it were, and, uh, and a guy named Mark Bowman, who was an awesome barbershop or singer uh, of all parts and a great guy. So we sang there during the summer and had a blast. And that's why I got to know Paul being a great guy and a stud baritone. It was like, even though we were singing outside and no one was pay, paying attention, they were screaming on the coasters and stuff. We had a great rehearsal ethic and Paul was always stealth and dead on. So to me, it was like when, when we knew that it couldn't move forward with Jeff and we weren't sure that we'd be able to continue, we still had about 36 shows booked. So initially, I think we had decided that we might not even compete in 87. Oh, wow. But we Try to keep our commitments to all the chapters that had booked us in advance. Right. So was just looking for a replacement to help us with that because Jeff would not be able to help us on Saturdays anymore. So initially it started that way and then Paul just tore it up. So when we asked him to learn, he learned everything. I mean, just hit it out of the park vocally and visually. And back then there was a lot of planned synced choreography right. in our style. And the rivals and the Cincinnati kids and the Rapscallions did about as much as anybody back in the 80s. So, man, he hit it out of the park at every level of play. And then the more people would hear us on shows starting in September of 86, culminating at the midwinter in Sarasota in January of 87, where the reigning five medalists went 
uh, and the Rorod 4 was awesome, and the Purple Cow, as it were, in Sarasota. So that was a neat hookup with our reigning champs. Calvin Yoder, one of the all-time greats and one of my all-time great teachers, he helped me a lot between second and first with the interstate rivals, getting us and myself to believe in myself. Thank you, Calvin. Yeah. So that aspect of it, you know, Paul hit it out of the park. And then after the midwinter, when everyone was saying, well, shouldn't you give it at least one more go with Paul? We said, okay, I guess we will. And then we <laughs> had 87 prelims in the Cardinal contest and qualified. And then obviously in Hartford, we were fortunate enough to win it all. Yeah, that's fantastic. And then it's, just after that international contest that another person comes into your life who also has a huge impact on you and that is uh, the late and great Jim Casey. I'd love uh, for you to tell our audience again this is another one of those giants that has has been gone for enough of a time that a lot of younger barbershoppers don't even know who he was and, and what his contributions were. I will and I'm going to take a quick sip of water and sure. I would suggest you and JoJo and everyone at home do the same because staying hydrated is very important, especially during these pandemic times. Excuse me. That's right. I'll, I'll do the same thing here. Essentia, <laughs> for the overachieving barbershopper. <laughs> I think on camera to save you the angle. The views expressed on this program do not necessarily reflect those of Shop Chat or the Shop Chat uh, production <laughs> team. <laughs> now the Jim Casey story is awesome so he would be proud of me for hydrating before we continue thanks for your patience sure thing so actually although I knew of Jim in 1982 he sang lead in a quartet called Texas Gold who was a quarter finalist in the 1982 international in Pittsburgh Pennsylvania so my first true data point was seeing this big man with a huge voice sing lead in this quartet that had the tenor of the dealer's choice, Al Quanley, the 1973 champs, and the stud baritone, Bill Thompson of the OK4, Jim Massey and all those, a, a long time great entertaining top 10 international quartet back in the 70s. So they had some clientele in the quartet too, so to speak. So Jim had a nice ensemble cast around him. And man, when I heard his voice and how crystal clear and big and effortless it was, he was always on my radar just from that, although we never officially met in person at that contest. Now, fast forwarding ahead to 1988, was at the Music Educators National Convention in San Antonio, Texas. And because fortunately the interstate rivals were the reigning international champions at the time. We were invited as the guest quartet for the barbershop side of things, if mm -hmm. you will, at this national convention. And of course, part of that hookup came via Jim and Glendy, Glenda Casey, sorry, excuse me, his lovely wife, Glenda. So they were part of the hookup there with the Barbershop Harmony Society and getting the reigning champs. And we happened to be the lucky reigning champs at that time. So because the rivals couldn't say no, it seems like we still can't, even decades later. <laughs> we would jump at any type of uh, performance opportunity that arose. So when they told us about this, we definitely wanted to be involved. We had had a real intense spring show schedule. And we arrived there, and we were all dragging a bit physically and vocally and mentally. But it was such an uplifting experience in a different setting that was Definitely new to all of us, except Jay had gone through music education, Bowling Green. So he's one of those stud Bowling Green grad gold medalist, as it were, from up right. in northern Ohio. So that aspect of play and singing there at the end of the night, we do our package and vocally tired, especially the lead singer, yours truly. So afterwards, we're done and, you know, hanging out and uh, talking to everybody, which was awesome. And I'm off in a corner a bit and a bit beat and a bit down that my voice didn't hang in there as well as I had hoped. And boom, I turn around and there's this huge man lurking over me, softly uh, stepped up behind me and didn't realize he was there. He was that quiet and real unassuming. He goes, hey, uh, do you mind if we talk for a bit? And I was like, absolutely. Uh, and he goes, I don't know if you know who I am, but of course me being geek barbershopper. Right. Jim Casey, 1982 quarter finalist from Texas. <laughs> about that. So in a funny way, he was like, 
he looked at me like as an oddity, but it was like, yeah, that's sort of cool that he knows that. <laughs> right, right. So, yep, in a cool way, we just walked over to this vacant table off to the side. There's other activity going in the main room, and it, it seemed like it was just him and I in the corner. And before I knew it, he's talking to me about how I tick, how I'm wired, about my voice, how I felt about my voice. And his comment was, Shane, after we got to that back table, before he shared any of the information was we sit down, he sees that I'm in a comfortable spot, it seems, and he goes, hey, uh, do you wanna have your voice and be able to sing 10 years from now? And it was like, <laughs> it was like he had virtually slapped me upside the face respectfully. Right. Like, right. Uh, a a absolutely I do. Like that wasn't on my radar at all. Even though I was vocally tired and trashed as it were that evening, I figured after I'd sleep and, you know, I was still young, I'd be fine. I'm 23 and it was like, nah, we need to talk about that. Uh-oh. Sorry, Shane, are you That's still okay. there? Yeah, I'm still here. There we go. We just lost video for a second. Oh, yeah. they've, been, they've uh, declined. Yeah. So that aspect of it, he had me very disarmed and in a great way was like, so I'm, I'm happy to help you with that if you're interested in any feedback. And he goes, I know in a cool way he was downplaying his skills now i know you're more accomplished than i am and of course i was clueless to the fact of everything he had done outside of barbershop of course too and i go right. now i the first time i heard you jim i thought you were awesome and everything i loved your voice and and i like you even more now that you came up to me and shared this and so back then when it was still your handheld tape recorder you younger members jojo you'll have to google that when your <laughs> handheld tape recorder it was like Hey, Jim, if I send you a recording of myself singing some of Interstate Rivals rep, would you mind just giving me some feedback? I'll mail you a tape. You give me feedback. And he goes, absolutely, would be happy to do that. So that's officially how our relationship started. He was concerned for me. He had heard me sing for several years with the Rivals, had watched our uh, rise, if you will, throughout the contest scene, and knew that we won and we were young at the time. and. He said it at the right time where I was willing to hear it. Of course, Jim had the knack for that with anyone he came across. So that aspect of it, I feel certain that him, Jim DeBusman too, and Bob Muka, Jeff's father, the mm. three of them were huge in helping me still be able to have a, sem a semblance of an instrument today at 55 years old. I would definitely not be able to sing today without hydrating. Water is what I've been drinking. It's 90% of what I drink and it has been for a couple of decades. Right. And the three guys put me on the right path. Gotcha. So when, when you listen to an Interstate Rivals recording in which you hear this amazing but raw lead voice that just has a visceral a impact, but then you a few years later listen to Keepsake and now that same voice has just opened up to this beautiful artistic instrument is it Jim that you primarily credit with the changes that happened in your voice from interstate rivals to keepsake it was a combination of Jim and Larry Ager but certainly Don Barney Tony DeRosa and Roger Ross so the aspect of that in their history that that environment was pretty stealth as was the interstate rivals we had a great work ethic and yeah. both of Quartets would sing for five or six hours at a crack. But the reason I was able to make that transition, and thanks for pointing it out, it was it was a big transition and very scary at the time because mm -hmm. I knew I had had success doing it one way. Sure. And I would not be able to continue doing it that way with the ensemble sound of Keepsake. And if I had not had the relationship with Jim Casey for a couple of years prior to that, he would never have earned enough of my confidence to make that switch. He goes, hey, man, here's the news. <laughs> yeah, You're going to have to totally rethink the way you've been singing lead, and it's going to take some work and effort and concentration. Are you up for the journey? And I was like, if you're leading the way, absolutely. So he was instrumental, no doubt, but it was also my quartet teammates and Larry Ager that provided the confidence and the education. It was like, yeah, man, that's it. That's, that's the sound we need. So... It was the reinforcement and work ethic of those around me, too. So can you give us just a quick history then on how Keepsake came together as a quartet? How did you end up going from 
living in Ohio down to Florida and then hooking up with another great set of singers. No, initially in a cool way, right after the interstate rivals had won. So I knew of Tony DeRosa back in 1985 when he was the stud little full voice tenor of the Cypress Court Club. Right. So he competed in that contest when the interstate rivals competed in Minneapolis in 85. So I remember seeing him and thinking, man, that young kid's pretty good. Just <laughs> so I knew of Tony in a fun way before I knew of any of the other DeRosas. But then at the midwinter convention that I had mentioned earlier in Sarasota, mm -hmm. the DeRosa family attended that in a cool way. And that's when I got to meet Tony's older sister and the rest of the family, Chris DeRosa at the time. So I was smitten with Chris. I thought she was the greatest when we met. And so immediately, you know, I wanted to be wherever Chris was. Ah. So I loved, fell in love with the DeRosa family, fell in love with Chris, wanted to be down close to them. Needless to say, my quartet mates and family up in Ohio and Kentucky weren't as excited when I immediately <laughs> moved to Florida after the rivals had closed out <laughs> the sure. title of it. But they were understanding and very supportive after we rolled. But now in a fun way, Shane, I tell everyone that I was dating Chris just to get to Tony. <laughs> That's fantastic. Well, um, you know, I know that I speak for a lot of barbershoppers when I, uh, there's so many of my friends uh, that I know that I uh, attribute Keepsake as the quartet that got them hooked on barbershop, which I know, you know, is certainly the case for me. Well, ladies and gentlemen, when you're going to have the chance to interview a legend, you don't expect to get it all into one episode. So we are excited to present today part one of a two-part series with the legendary bye Joe Cotton. Bye, baby. Remember you're my baby when they give you the eye. Although I know that you care, won't you write and declare that though on the loose you are still on the square. I'll be gloomy. But send that rainbow to me, then my shadows will fly. Though you'll be gone for a while, I know that I'll be smiling with my baby by and by. And